Good evening and welcome to the UVA Clubs in Florida virtual lecture with Commonwealth Professor Richard Guy Wilson. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight and I hope everyone is safe and well. My name is Joshua Stewart, UVA class of 2018 and assistant director for the UVA Clubs in Global Engagement. Um, I have the pleasure of working with three clubs in Florida, uh, UVA Club of Palm Beaches, UVA Club of Jacksonville, and the UVA Club of Greater Orlando. Um, before we get started, I would like to go over a few Zoom rules. Um, one, for those who are already here and have already put their names in, thank you. Um, but for those who have joined, feel free to uh, share your name and UVA affiliation. Um, it's always nice to know uh, what who's are in the room. And then two, throughout the talk, please feel free to input any questions you have in the Q&A box. Um, that's right beside the chat function. Um, and we will get to them at the conclusion of Professor Wilson's talk. Uh, I would now like to introduce Vice President of the UVA Club of Greater Orlando, Scott French. Thanks, Josh. Uh, good evening, everybody. Great to join all of you here. Um, I wanted to give you a little background on how this all came together. Um, last month, uh, we there was a, a shuffling of duties and, and we had a new REO, Josh. And Josh Stewart uh, invited us, uh, the Florida groups, to a happy hour, a social, just a chance to get together and chat. And um, in that meeting, we talked about networking and ways that the clubs could get together. And uh, one of the ideas was, uh, you know, to have uh, shared speakers but also how to do that in the midst of the COVID-19, um, you know, lockdown, how could we, how could we uh, maybe use Zoom to do that? And kicked a number of ideas around. Josh suggested the idea of a speaker series or just some way of bringing speakers in under a theme, uh, history and architecture. And um, everybody loved the idea and then Josh made it happen. Uh, so this is the first of what we hope will be several um, speakers. Uh, we're so thrilled to have Richard Guy Wilson uh, to kick this off. Um, I've known uh, Professor Wilson for many, many years, going back uh, to not, probably around 1988 when I first arrived at UVA um, as a graduate student in history, PhD candidate. Um, and I also have had the pleasure of, of working with Richard for many years and seeing him more recently here in Florida. Uh, Richard, uh, Professor Wilson often visits Florida almost every year to um, talk about, to, to, to uh, work with the uh, Morse Museum in Winter Park. And so we have a chance to see him here in Florida. Um, he was ex actually supposed to be here last week. Um, but obviously that he was here, but they, the talk did not go up. But we have a chance to hear him tonight, and that's very exciting. Um, and so I'd like to make my introduction now. Um, Richard Guy Wilson is the Commonwealth Professor's Chair Emeritus in Architectural History at the University of Virginia School of Architecture. His many books, articles, and exhibits address different aspects of American and modern architecture, including the American Renaissance, the Kim Mead and White Architects, and Buildings of Virginia and Thomas Jefferson. And tonight, Professor Wilson will be speaking on the design of the academical village, uh, time and place. And so, Professor Wilson, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Scott, and thank you, uh, Joshua. And I'm very glad to be here. And I'm sure that there are a couple of you out there that I might know, um, but unfortunately, I can't really, I can wave, but I, you can't wave back to me. Anyway, um, we are, this is the 195th anniversary this year of the first class that entered uh, the University of Virginia in, uh, uh, eight, uh, in 1825. Um, and what I'm going to talk about, of course, is the design of the Academical Village. Uh, as you know, the University of Virginia is known for many things. Faculty, students, our wonderful library, our collections, uh, our alumni, but also it's the architecture. And that's what really I am going to uh, focus on. Uh, Jefferson, in case you didn't know, was an architectural, can I say nut, 
uh, of really the first order. Uh, architecture to him was very, very important. And there are many quotes that I could give, but I'll just give one right here. And that is that architecture is among the most important arts and it is desirable to introduce taste into an art which shows so much. He wrote this uh, in, in, in a article uh, that he did uh, about what Americans ought to be seeing when they go abroad, that they ought to be taking a look at the architecture uh, that was over there. Uh, and one of the results of this uh, is, of course, the academical village here at the University of Virginia, but there's also a bunch of other things uh, as well, and I'm just going to touch on those a little bit briefly, uh, you know, a little bit briefly in my talk. Now, here we are um, on the left. Uh, is the first known uh, portrait uh, of Jefferson, uh, as you can see, uh, painted in 1786. He is actually in, it was actually painted in London uh, by an American uh, who was over there studying to be an artist. Um, and as you can see, of course, he's rather dressed up there and has on a white wig. Uh, on the right is one of the very last known portraits of Jefferson uh, by uh, Thomas Sully. Uh, and as you can see, he's painted in 1822. And of course, he is aged, as it happens with all of us. Uh, but what I think is interesting in this is that, of course, uh, what you see there is a gigantic column. Uh, and Sully, who was a Boston-based painter, had come down here to paint uh, ahead of Jefferson, which was to be uh, in the United States Capitol. But he was so impressed by what he saw going on that he did two full length portraits. This one right here actually hangs up at West Point because if you didn't know, Jefferson is the founder of West Point Military Academy. But as you can see that you have, you, as you can see, you have, uh, uh, you have, you have this column. Uh, Jefferson, of course, is known for many, many different things. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, uh, already mentioned that he wrote many things. Uh, he was very interested in science. Um, of course, he was a politician, but he also introduced French fries to this country. Uh, he is apparently the first American who came back from France uh, and brought back uh, palm frites, uh, the idea of palm frites. So he is a, an individual of many, many, many uh, diverse, uh, diverse talents. Now, just a little bit of background in case you don't know, uh, on the left is a shot. I am standing on top of the site where his parents' house stood, Peter Jefferson's house stood, and where he was born. Uh, and I'm looking off in the distance, and that hill that you see there right in the middle, uh, that's Monticello. Uh, and he was born, and he passed away, and he lived within the site of, this is basically three, four miles distance here, really for most of his life, though he did do a, consider a considerable amount of traveling. Uh, the um, uh, up there on the top of the hill is where he started building Monticello. And in case you don't know, there were two Monticellos. This is the first Monticello that he started to put up in 1768. And then it took many, many years for the thing to be uh, built. Actually, there's a big question about exactly how much of this, how much of this ever built. Uh, but he got the thing sort of completed, maybe in 1782. Then he takes off for Europe. His wife had just passed away. He takes off for Europe and is gone for five years. He comes back and he builds the monotel that we all know that we see right there. I'm showing you on the left, this is a model uh, of, uh, excuse me, that's my dog. Uh, this is a model of, of Monticello one, just to, show, just to show the differences. And what it does show here is also, uh, as they say, that he is a person who is really consumed by architecture. Uh, and as he said in different types, uh, different places, but this is one here, uh, architecture is my delight and putting up and pulling down one of my favorite amusements. Uh, and in other words, this is a house that he is constantly in work on all of his life. And that gives a sort of indication of some of his, architect uh, some of his architectural interests. Now, how did he learn architecture? We should keep in mind that architecture was not really an established profession. Uh, we, the American Institute of Architects that we have in this country, the AIA was not founded until 1857. But how did people learn architecture back in this time? Well, Jefferson learned it in three ways. 
number one books. Of course, he was a bibliomaniac of the worst order, but he had probably the largest architectural book collection in this country. One of his favorites was Andrea Palladio, the great Italian Renaissance architect. Uh, and I'm just showing you here, but he had a number of different editions of this, but he had many, many other architectural books. And this is one way that he learned architecture. The second way that he learned architecture, and this is very important to keep in mind back at that point in time, architects also did the buildings. They were involved in the construction. And he knew intimately all of the different details of construction. Now, not that he built all of the buildings, and of course, there is another side to Jefferson that we uh, sometimes, well, is very, very apparent in recent years, and that is that he owned many slaves. He trained many of those individuals who worked for him, and they are the people that did a lot of the different work of whether it is some of the woodworking that we're showing the tools on the left, or this is the making of, making of bricks here. But architecture and construction was, was together. The third uh, way that he learned architecture was through travel. Uh, and he traveled extensively throughout the United States or what would be the United States. He was very, very disparaging of the architecture that we had here. And in his book on the notes of the state of Virginia, and while it's the state of Virginia, it's a little bit bigger, uh, his focus in it, he says, and I quote, the private buildings are rarely constructed of stone or brick, much the greater portion being of scanning and boards, plaster with lime, it is impossible to devise things more ugly, uncomfortable, and happily more perishable. In other words, he wanted to get rid of that. Now, of course, they were out there preserving all of those early things. But one of the things that does come out of his travels, and as I mentioned earlier, he spent a number of years abroad, basically in France, so traveling throughout Europe, was, for instance, he did go down and see this Roman temple that you see on the right there, the Maison Caire in Nîmes in France, which is one of the best preserved Roman temples of all times. And that is the basis for his design for the Virginia State Capitol down in Richmond, which he designed while he was in Paris, but basing it on this. And I would say that this is probably his most important building. No, his greatest is the University of Virginia, but the most important because this is the first public building built after the revolution in this country, and it sets in motion this identification of American architecture with the architecture of Rome, uh, of Rome and Greece. Um, Jefferson's involvement in architecture is very extensive, and I'm not going to go through all of this. This would be a lecture that we would go on for well, I've given courses on this. I'm working on a book on this. Uh, but he's very involved in Washington, D.C., laying out the plan of Washington, D.C. That's his scheme for it there on the left. That's the Potomac River, as you can see, he's coming down. And he sort of sees a, a, a grouping of blocks and so forth. This isn't exactly the way the plan will turn out. He's very involved in the plan. On the right, this is a cartoon from the Washington Post of a number of years ago over the competition for the United States Capitol. He was very, very involved in the design of the President's House, or today the White House, the United States Capitol. His finger is in every one of these darn, darn things. And just again, to just briefly say, here are some of the other buildings that are scattered around uh, Virginia, are here basically uh, in the Tidewater Piedmont, uh, uh, courthouse, which is up on the right, a couple of houses, you can see Farmington uh, and Edgemont, and then his own getaway retreat, Poplar Forest, which is down just outside, outside of Lynchburg. But architecture was a passion of his for his entire life. So coming to the University of Virginia and the design of the University of Virginia, Jefferson was very concerned about the education of the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And in 1779, while he was governor, he does put forward a proposal that the Commonwealth ought to take the responsibility for the education of all classes of people, and that there ought to be three levels of education, a primary level, a secondary level, and then a collegiate level. And he actually proposes that the, unit, that the state ought to take over uh, the College of William and Mary. They did not do that, but this is something that was in his mind from all in his mind from all the way along. And that brings me to the College of William and Mary. This is where he attended college. He attended the College of William and Mary for about three and a half years. 
The College of William and Mary was located in the one big building that you see there in the center of the screen, the so-called Wren Building. And then there are two buildings to either side, which one is Bafferton Hall, which is for, this, uh, for the training of the Native Americans and in the President's House. But it is in that one big building where the 30 to 40 odd young white males lived, took their classes, ate, and also went out and partied in town. And Jefferson does remark that he unfortunately did take place in a lot of these activities, a lot of these activities when he was down at the College of William Merritt. So if you think about this for a minute, there is maybe slight similarities in the sense of a central building and then these two buildings to the side, but still at the same time of putting everybody in the same building, no way. That is not what is gonna be here, uh, not what gonna be here at the University of Virginia. Well, anyway, scampering on ahead, in June 1814, here in the town of Charlottesville, a group of men, many of them buddies of Jefferson's, had come together with an idea that they might create a local academy to train the young men. And they were gonna call it the Albemarle Academy. And they were having a meeting downtown on Market Street in the Old Stone Tavern, which no longer stands, but there's a historical marker up there. And they were having this meeting and somebody looked up and there was Jefferson riding by, so hey, hey, come in here. Well, of course he came in and he took over the whole damn thing and took, uh, took over the idea of the Albemarle Academy. And in the next couple of weeks, month or so, he comes up for a scheme for this Albemarle Academy. And this is two sides. This is one side, you'll see the other side in half a minute of a single sheet of paper. Notice that way that's torn away down there in the corner. But he comes up with this idea from Albemarle Academy of a huge open U-shape 257 yards across, with then around it, as you can see, these buildings and so forth, sort of nine pavilions for the teachers, and then in between the spaces for the students, and then on the right you have some of the specifications. And then we turn the sheet of paper over, and again, look down the corner, you can see, I just showed you a minute ago, the way it's torn apart there. On the other side, you've got this scheme here for what would be the teacher's pavilion, with the classroom on the ground floor, that's in the center, and then upstairs the teacher would live, and then these spread out. Well, what happens with this is that this scheme begins to grow. And Jefferson says, well, layman, maybe we ought to try for something a little bit better. Maybe we ought to try for a college. And it changes into Central College, they are able to get some money from the state legislature for the idea that the state might have a college up here in the Piedmont area of Virginia. And in 1817, they get some money. They're able to begin to think about buying some land. And in the next year and a half, two years, they purchase the land. And this is Jefferson's uh, layout here of a lot of the lands that were the university. Uh, and if you look very, very closely at the right hand side uh, on this, you can see a sort of, this is the, the, the corner is down there where those roads come together. And you've got what is today, uh, uh, what is today JPA uh, and the corner. And there you've got sort of a layout of the university, but he projects that this is gonna grow. It's Central College and then in 1819, the name is changed to the University of Virginia. Now. He's got this idea for this college. They get some money from the state. What the heck are they going to do with this? And so what is interesting with Jefferson, and he is always a person who is willing to reach out to grab other people's ideas. He writes off a letter, which I'm showing you there on the left, and it's dated in the upper right-hand side, as you can see, Monticello, May 9.17. Down at the bottom, it says Dr. Thornton. Dr. Thornton was the original architect for the United States Capitol and was a buddy of Jefferson. And Jefferson in this letter to Thornton says, we're gonna start this central college. We're gonna have these nine pavilions around it. Would you maybe send me some ideas for these pavilions? I want no two alike because they are be specimens for the architectural lectures. In other words, and this is so important, 
your environment was to teach you as well. It wasn't just the professor blabbering away in a classroom, but it's the environment that you're in is to be there. Well, Thornton gets a little mixed up, <coughs> excuse me, and he sends back this one drawing, which we have right here, in which he says, well, look, you've got these nine pavilions, three across the top, three down the sides, make that central building up at the top, you put a pediment on that, and then the other eight buildings don't have a pediment, have this flat top that come down the sides with this arcade in the ground floor and then the columns across this. Well, I can only imagine that Jefferson looks at this and says, hmm, well, maybe okay. And so what happens is that they lay the cornerstone in October 1817 for pavilion number seven. And as you can see, there it is on the left. And that, of course, is today the Colonnade Club. And it's basically Thornton's scheme that he is using there. But as soon as he gets Thornton's scheme back and they begin to do the foundations and then ultimately lay the cornerstone, he sends off the same letter to another architect buddy of his by the name of Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Benjamin Henry Latrobe, and it was exactly the same letter, Jefferson, in case you don't know, had this copy machine that he used for all of his letters. He sent the same letter off to Latrobe. Latrobe sends back this letter right here, as you can see, dated July 24th, 1817, and he says, hey, Mr. Jefferson, and, Jeff and I should say Latrobe is the second architect for the United States Capitol, and he's also the person that's responsible for the big front on the White House in Washington, D.C., and he was a buddy of Jefferson's. He says, look, at what you really ought to do, and we're still talking about this huge 257-yard scheme, is that put in the center a domed building up there, and then put your other pavilions around this. Hey, that's a pretty good idea, Jefferson says, and so they begin to really do the work here. Now, the problem was that Jefferson was showing this scheme for this 257 yards, which is about two and a half Scott stadiums or two and a half football fields wide. And of course, the land was very uneven. You know all what the Piedmont is like and so forth, these rolling hills and all of that. It would have been great if it was down in the tidewater or if we were out in Iowa putting up the thing, but certainly not here in the Piedmont. But he has to adjust this. And so what happens, and I'm just showing you uh, on the right, there are a lot of these different drawings. We are very lucky. We have most of them here at the University of Virginia, a few up at the Library of Congress and also scattered around in other collections. Uh, but you can see that what he's doing is he is taking a pair of scissors, he lays out something, and he's taking a pair of scissors and cutting out something and sticking something else in. He's playing around with the idea of the scheme. But ultimately what happens is that they can only do this university on something that would be much, much shorter. And so ultimately it becomes 180 feet across from one side to the other side of the lawn with at the top this round dome building and then now there are 10 pavilions that are scattered down the sides. Behind them, gardens, and then out the ranges and so forth, where students are also live, as well as the students living in, in, in the rooms in between, the, in between the different pavilions. They changed it from the original nine up to 10 because there's a board of visitors and they decided that they have 10 disciplines here. And so each pavilion is to be a, each pavilion is to be a different discipline. So they finally do settle on a plan. The plan is basically done by 1819, but we don't really have a full plan until we get this very famous Maverick engraving, which you see on the left, which was done in 1822. And guess what? It was done as a fundraiser for the university. They were selling it to the, uh, uh, selling it, uh, uh, to the students and uh, to, or the prospective students uh, and to others. For the central building, the rotunda. Jefferson does this design that you see here on the right. And this is, uh, again, this is Jefferson. It is very, very interesting. And if you look very, very closely at it, you can see the dome up on the top. And then if you come down, you can see a sort of a dot, 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 dot. He's enclosing a perfect sphere 
in this building. Now it is based upon one of the most famous buildings of all time, uh, the Pantheon in Rome, uh, which is if you go to Rome, you're going to go see the Pantheon. It was one of the great Roman temples that went through a number of different uses and so forth. Uh, at one time it actually became a Christian church. Uh, but this is one of the great buildings of all time. And this is what Jefferson is basing the thing on, though his design is about not quite one half of the size. He's basing it upon this drawing out of Palladio uh, that you see there on the left. And of course, he's making, uh, making modifications. But the importance of this is, what does it stand for? This is one of the greatest buildings of all time, but it's a perfect geometry, the sphere. And of course, the circle is one of the most perfect forms that you have of all time. And then what you have is that this is going to become the library of the university. And so here we have a section. And once again, if you look on the right, you can see the dotted line coming down, showing this perfect sphere. You have the two lower floors. You have chemistry lab on the ground floor, and then classroom lectures. And upstairs is the library. He selects all 8,500 books that are going to be in there. But what is very fascinating about this is, and I'm showing you this thing on the left, he had done his scheme for the United States Capitol back in 1791 when they were fooling around up in Washington, D.C. And this is basically the floor plan right there for the floor plan for the rotunda here at the university. Now in this, of course, it's labeled House of Representatives, the Senate, Palace of Justice, and so forth, but it's basically that. So my point here is that this is an idea that's been floating around in Jefferson's mind for many, many years. And then finally, well, okay, yes, I did get a dome up there at the up at Monticello, but this is the perfect building. And this is the building that is to be the symbolization of knowledge. This is a symbolization of this perfect, uh, 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 of this perfect form. Just as sort of a footnote of how that dome was held up, when he was over in Paris in the 1780s, he picked up a book by Mr. Philbert Delorme that had been written and then republished a number of different times, but written back in the 16th century of how you might build a dome not out of masonry, but out of wood. And as you can see, this is a wood it's a sort of a very heavy, and in a certain sense, these are uh, glued together, pieces of wood, then with peg joints, that you construct this type of a dome that was being used. And this was used over there in Paris, was used over there in Paris, and became a very popular thing because most people don't have the money and so forth to build domes that are going to be built, uh, that are going to be built out of masonry. The building was completed, the books moved in, and this became the center of the university. Unfortunately, there was a big fire, which I'll be coming to in a few minutes, in, in, uh, in 1895, and destroyed it. And we only have, I think, three known photographs of the interior of the rotunda that we have here on, uh, I'm showing you there on the right, shortly before the fire. This is it after it's been reconstructed and then restored and so forth here on the left. And just to note, as a footnote to this, Jefferson had a scheme for the interior of the rotunda that it would be painted a dark blue and he had seen over in Paris a contraption that would project lights up there and to become a planetarium at night. And so this would really be this whole center of the universe that would be here at the university. And I should note that some wonderful students uh, earlier this year did do a scheme here uh, for projecting the lights up there. And every once in a while, I think still on weekends, uh, you, sometimes can get, you sometimes can get that done. Uh, so this is a building that has many, many different levels of meaning and so forth for Jeffers and so forth. Um, if you compare the University of Virginia with other colleges or quote universities at the time, there's a big difference. At all of them, I'm just showing you Yale rod right here, there's chapels, they're religious. Now Jefferson's questions about his religion and so forth is something that preoccupies a lot of people. He was, I think, a believer in some sort of an almighty. However, he did not think that the university ought to be controlled 
by a religion. And that was the standard method of all colleges and universities. We're not the first public university. The University of South Carolina is the first. The university of Carif North Carolina is the second. Where's the University of North Carolina located? What's the name of its town? Chapel Hill. You get the idea where I'm going here with this. But this is one of the things that he said, religion will be taught here at the university, but it is not to be the center of, it is not, it is not to be the center. Coming back to the lawn and the idea of the teaching environment, he wanted all 10 of the pavilions, each one to be different and to be specimens for the architectural lectures. And so what you have, we're looking at pavilion number two, here's his drawing on the left, and on the right is the plate out of the book of uh, Palladio that he chose it from. And it is a temple for Tuna Virilis in Rome, which is actually still there, the temple of Tuna Virilis. He's picking up on that and using that as the front. Uh, using that as the front. Uh, and here it is, here's pavilion number two, as you can see on the back of his drawing, I just showed you a minute ago, on the back of the drawing, here's all of his specifications, the dimensions. He does his dimensions down to one one hundredth of an inch. Can you imagine what the workmen must have thought about that when they got these sort of dimensions and so forth? But as you can see, this is a ionic order that is used there. Uh, across from it is pavilion number one, and this is the Doric of Diocletian's baths. And so this is a very different order. So you have the Doric on one side and the Ionic on the other side. This drawing is a sort of an interesting thing because you can see to some degree, if you notice that weird thing that's sort of up at the top of the facade, something's up there. Well, it's actually a piece of paper that's taped on the back because he drew this thing out and then oh my goodness, I forgot the chimney. And so he's taped on the chimney that is put on, uh, 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 that's uh, put on up there. And here we are. Uh, this is, uh, and I should say that all of these pavilions, uh, they're, they're in sort of competition with each other. Uh, but, and there's been a lot of speculation by scholars about the different meanings and so forth. But one of the things is that you always have a palladial, palladial drawing or a palladial source across from Chambrain Edouard. And this is another very famous book that he liked. And so there is this sort of a dialogue that is going on about architecture. Uh, as you go on down the lawn, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you will see other uh, pavilions and so forth with different orders, uh, such as we get right here. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the Corinthian order of, from Chambray. Uh, here down at the very end of the lawn, these are the last two pavilions, though I should say that he did foresee that the lawn could be extended onwards and onwards and onwards. Uh, if, if we'd followed his directions on this, we'd only be down to Lynchburg by now with, uh, with the university uh, just stretched out. Uh, but uh, this is the very last one, it's pavilion number nine on the right, and pavilion number 10 on the left. And as you can see, this sets, and this is one of the wonderful things about the lawn, is that it is really a teaching, it's really a teaching tool. Um, once again, to go back to construction of this, uh, the construction began in 1817, uh, and it was basically all completed. Uh, the first class came in in 1825, uh, but it was basically all completed on his death on July 4th, 1826, or a couple of things. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work and other scholars as well on the work that was done here. And it's worthwhile to note that there were many enslaved individuals who did the work uh, that was done here at the uh, university and that they have to be put in, they have to be put into the story. Uh, just a couple of footnotes here about different things that have been going on over the years. Uh, some of you, depending on the last time you were here, may have known Pavilion 10 is looking like that there on the left. Uh, and then a few years ago, we did the restoration of it. Uh, that attic up on the top had fallen off. That has been put back. And the, co the colors have been changed because Jefferson didn't have it white. It was a gray color because what he was trying to do was he's trying to make the thing look like it was stone. And so here we're looking at, uh, these are some col restored Tuscan columns which are in front of the student rooms. And as you can see, and I'm trying to show you there on the right, the difference in the colors and so forth, because he wanted to make this look like stone. And also just simply to note that white paint was very expensive and would have a lot of upkeep. 
It's estimated that on some of these columns here, we have more than 170 different coats of paint that have been put on them, uh, put on them uh, over, over the years. So what we have here is a virtual museum, or we can say a school of architecture. Now, there was not a professional school of architecture here at the time, but it is out of this that the students would learn. And then, of course, you go on out to the outer side, to the long arcades that are in front of the ranges, and then the hotels or hotels, which is where the students took their classes, since, uh, uh, excuse me, took some classes, but also, uh, but also ate their meals. And then behind the pavilions, you had the gardens. Now they've all been redone, but originally these gardens with the serpentine walls, this is where uh, the professors would be growing and the hotel keepers would be growing some of the food, not a lot of it, but the sort of the garden kitchen and so forth for the food. And it wouldn't be sort of a nice garden like this, which is a wonderful place to go and relax in the afternoon, uh, put down your phone, put down your computer, uh, sit out there and read a book uh, and, just, and, and, and just contemplate. So this is the way that the university looked in 1826. Uh, Jefferson had just passed away, uh, and this view here, it should be in there, but they had just put in some foundations for some trees that would line, uh, that would line the lawn, uh, but um, uh, they're, not, uh, they're, not being, uh, they're not being shown. Uh, here we are, and I'm just going to very, very quickly uh, conclude here that, of course, the place changed. The place changed dramatically over the years. Uh, and you can get here, this is the big annex that was put onto uh, uh, the rotunda in the 1850s because the way of education changed very dramatically. It needed different sorts of lecture spaces and all of this. You can see down in the foreground, that square building that is down there, that was Jefferson's very last design for the university. And this is an astronomical theater. And this is where the surgeon would be teaching a dissection and the parts of the body. Uh, that unfortunately is gone. There's sort of a mark out there. It's out in front of, uh, out in front of Alderman Library. Um, a bunch of heathens were being trained up here in Charlottesville and so forth, and it became a big concern. Uh, and there were a couple of different proposals. On the left, I'm showing you a proposal, and this was in 1859, to put a chapel right smack dab in the middle of the lawn that we put there uh, to teach a religion. Uh, there is something that's going to happen in the next couple of years, and so not much would happen here uh, in Charlottesville, uh, and that did not happen. But we finally did get our chapel uh, in the 1880s, as you can see there on the right. And it's a wonderful building. And it helps out on the story of the university because this, of course, is the Gothic style here. And so that what you have is you have a range of different buildings that are around it. I'm going to go through all of these. But what you have is the, the idea of the university as a teaching environment continue. Well, October 27th, 1895, a fire broke out. It was on a Sunday morning. Uh, that's the reason why everybody's dressed in black there. They've been off the church. This fire broke out and, of course, consumed uh, the rotunda and the annex. Uh, it was rebuilt after designs by the eminent New York firm of McKim, Mead, and White, which were the premier architectural firm in the country. There were major, major changes that were made. And I'm showing you a section there. <laughs> because Jefferson's original floors were not put back inside. Instead, the entire thing became a rotunda, uh, became the library, as you can see in this old photograph here. And then this is the north front, where you'd had that big annex coming out, and this changes into a new sort of an entry into the, uh, new sort of entry into the academic, academical village. Uh, other buildings were built at the south end of the lawn, it's decided that they really ought to close that off, put in new buildings down there. This is Stanford White sketch for the buildings, which become Cabell, Cock, uh, and, R and Rouse Hall. This is just a very rough sketch of it. Um, and here we have now known as Old Cabell Hall and with this great auditorium that is on the center. And I bring this up because if you've ever been in there, hopefully you have, you have seen this great mural by George W. Breck. The original of this is in the Vatican in Athens. 
But what it is, is that you have this gathering together of all of the great intellects of the past, walking down the lawn away from the rotunda towards you, and you have Aristotle and Plato in the center discussing, one pointing up, one pointing down about where knowledge comes from, and the rest gathered around. In other words, the point is that I'm making here, and out in front, not back in, back in a few years, uh, it's worth out to look at these new murals that have been put up by Lincoln Perry, uh, continues on this theme uh, that architecture and art isn't just something to be looked at, that it is a has, it has really an, edu it has really an educational uh, component. <coughs> so here we are at the end of a very short talk on this. I could go on for, well, another couple of hours on this, uh, but I do think that it's worthwhile to look at. When you go up to Monticello, this is Jefferson's tombstone. Actually, it's not the original. The original had been chipped away by souvenir keepers over the years. And so they finally put up this one, put up a new one up there. And the original now is out in Jefferson City, Missouri, of all places. Uh, but if you read it carefully, you can see that you have here, that here lies, here's Barry Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statutes of Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. No mention. I was a governor, I was a president, anything like that, but really of three, what you might say, great intellectual and artistic and, arch and architectural achievements. So with that, I'll stop there. And if there are questions, be glad to answer some. Perfect, thank you so much, Professor Wilson. That was fantastic. And now we're gonna move into the uh, Q&A section. And uh, Scott, if you could take some of these questions. Sure, we already have a, a lineup here of questions. Uh, this is from Gary. Uh, has the university used construction in other areas of the campus or on other campuses to provide examples of more recent forms of architecture? Yes, we have. Uh, we have had, or we have our modern period. We've gone through a modern period and so forth uh, and did hire and have hired some of the most eminent uh, modern architects, uh, especially uh, up in North Grounds, uh, the, uh, 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 the law school up there is a good example of that. Uh, the architecture school here at the university was designed by Pietro Belushki and Saki Dawson and DeMay. Uh, Mr. Belushki was a very, very eminent modern architect. Uh, Saki Dawson DeMay uh, also very important architects. Uh, and so there are other buildings that are around that we've gone through uh, the modern, uh, modern period. But also, and this is one of these controversies, and this really gets hot, the closer we get to the lawn, the more that the buildings tend to stay within the Jefferson look and so forth. And for instance, the Special Collections Library, uh, completed a few years ago by the very eminent uh, Washington DC firm of, of Hartman Cox, is more in what you might say is a Jefferson mode, or uh, Michael Graves, a, a late Michael Graves, a, a very eminent postmodern architect, he did a building down at the end of the lawn, uh, that is, you might say, is in a postmodern sort of stuff. So yes, we have kept up, I think, with things and so forth uh, over, uh, over the years. Great. Uh, we have another question. This is from Paul Erickson. Can you talk about Stanford White's contributions to the lawn, both positive and negative? How was White true to Jefferson's ideal, and how did White express his own vision? Well, the Stanford White thing is, um, the reason why the firm got the work, if you want to know, was that Charles McKim, who was the head of the firm, actually came down here to Charlottesville in 1891, and he saw this university, and he says, I can't believe it, because Jefferson was unknown as an architect. I mean, the idea that he did anything, the University of Virginia was, you know, uh, it's the fire that really brought the thing, uh, that really brought it back. Uh, and so McKim angled for the job when the, uh, the job came up. Actually, the Board of Visitors uh, hired a not very good firm uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, who were doing, <coughs> doing a church here in town. And they came up with something that was ugh, 
Uh, and so the Board of Visitors turned around and said, let's get this firm that are angling for it, uh, McKim, Mead, and White. Uh, and Sanford White became the head for it. And I think that he tried to stay true to Jefferson uh, in the sense of the rotunda. But of course, Jefferson's 8,500 books and you know uh, what we'd had when he came up with this list, uh, publishing was very, very limited. And in the 19th century, just publishing was whammo, you know, you get books, 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 books. And so he opens up the entire interior for uh, uh, the library. And then finally, of course, it outgrows that and they move over to Alderman Library. Uh, but he, I think he tries to keep the Jefferson look there. Uh, the other problem was that Jefferson had envisioned that the way you would enter the lawn is from the way I am showing the view right here from the south end. But most people are coming into town up in the north, and so they weren't coming down there. So that's the reason why that big portico was put on on the north side of the rotunda, because that's the, per, the, the sort of the entry. <clears throat> One thing that he does change, but he didn't want to, was that the faculty said, we need some new education spaces, put some buildings down there at the end of the lawn. There is a letter from Sanford White and he says, I don't approve of it. But, well, architects, they are like, well, anyway, they do what you tell them to do. Uh, and so anyway, uh, I'll, no one put an analogy in there. Uh, and so anyway, uh, he does do the scheme for the closing off at the end of the lawn because Jefferson saw the thing as being opening up. But the problem was with the idea of Jefferson opening it up was in the other side of JPA, uh, there had grown up a lot of buildings and the view was not all that particularly, you did see off to the mountains, uh, but you didn't see anything, anything down there. And so this is a sort of a closing off of it. And we have a question from uh, Kita or Quita Offenberg. How has the rotunda been used throughout its history? Well, the rotunda, of course, was the centerpiece uh, in when Jefferson completed it. And it really was the centerpiece of the university. And you have the fire, uh, but it, it was the library. And you have to keep in mind that uh, the library up until a few years ago, I think they are still very, very important. I think it's very important that we have books and all of that. Uh, the, this was the place where students went, uh, did their reading, their research, uh, <coughs> research and all of that. Now, when they moved out, of, moved out over to Alderman Library in eight, 1937, the building sort of sat there uh, for many years uh, and really wasn't being used very much. And uh, in the 19, late 1960s, Frederick, Frederick Dovington Nichols, uh, who taught architectural history here at the university and was sort of my predecessor, if I dare say that, uh, on the expert on Jefferson, he led the campaign for the restoring of the interior of the rotunda and turning it back into what Jefferson looked like, putting back in the floor uh, and so forth up there. And still though, I don't think that it was being used that much. And so a number of years ago, I guess it's now about 10 years ago, there really was a campaign mounted that the rotunda needs to be open at night for students. The students need to be able to come in there at night to be using it for study space and so forth. And so that is using that. And then of course also is used for different sorts of events uh, and that type of thing. Perfect. Now we're gonna move into the Q&A box here. So the first question is from Kent Smith. Uh, refresh us on the white versus sand colored columns um, honoring the different periods of time. Jefferson did not use the color white. We always think of him as red brick and white trim, but he did not use the color of, of white here at the university. It was always a sand color because what he wanted the thing to look like was that they the columns and so forth are built out of stone. Now they're not built out of stone. Well, the capitals are, the capitals are carved and the bases, but the columns are molded brick, then with this thin skim coat of plaster around it with sand in it. So it does look like it's a stone type of material. And so it was always a gray type of gray type of color. However, 
that, and you can see it if you walk up and down the lawn and they're always doing restoration out there. You'll see cracks in it and cracks and cracks and cracks. So what the heck do we do with these damn cracks? So beginning about the 1850s, they began whitewashing the columns. So in the 1850s, the whitewash comes in. And as I said, there's estimated that in some <coughs> of the Tuscan columns, which are the low columns there in front of the student rooms, that there are maybe 150 different coats of paint that have been put on them. Now they're trying to get those off of there and they get it back to the original, uh, get it back to the original look. And so this gray color was the color uh, to be stoned because this is the way that the original temples and so forth were built over there in Greece and in, in Rome, if they weren't built out of marble, uh, were, built out of, were built out of stone. All right, Barry wants to know, oh, excuse me, an anonymous attendee. What is Professor Wilson's, what is, yeah, what is your favorite Jefferson biography for a comprehensive look at his life? Well, oh boy, <laughs> uh, there are so, so, so many books on Jefferson and so forth. I mean, I think that the, uh, 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 there's, oh, gee, I'm trying to, I'm looking over here to the side. Uh, uh, but uh, there is the five volumes book, oh boy, my mind's going on me, done a number of years ago, uh, which is really in many ways the comprehensive, but one of the, th uh, I do mom alone, excuse me, do mom alone. Uh, but one of the things that of course has changed, I would say in the past 20 years, and especially in the last 10 years, uh, is the recognition of slavery and all of this. And a lot of that was left out of the books and so forth, and now that is coming back in. Uh, and so it is, his life has gotten a lot more complicated. And of course, then there is, uh, there is all of the, uh, the issues that Sally Hemings uh, and that, and for many, many years, I mean, that was rumored around from way back in the, uh, eight, uh, way back in the early 19th century that he did have a mistress. Uh, but it was dismissed by scholars just endlessly, but now uh, it's been pretty much proven through DNA and all of that. And so there are other stories that are constantly coming into, coming, uh, co coming into play. All right, Barry has a question. He says, what is the approval process for either changes or restoration projects to the Academical Village? Uh, there's a couple of committees that are set up. There's the university architect, uh, and under that, there is a committee that is set up uh, that we go, I'm on it, uh, and we go over different sorts of things that are going on and what is to be done uh, and so forth and approval of it uh, and, and, and that type of thing. And then Drew asked and comments, so the annex to the rotunda was probably a design blunder. Do you think there were other blunders? <laughs> Well, it's very interesting. The, the Rotunda Annex was designed by an architect named Robert Mills. And Robert Mills was a preeminent, he had actually studied with Jefferson, had come down and used Jefferson's books up at Monticello. And there are some of his drawings for Monticello that he did for Jefferson way, 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 way back. Uh, and Mills did a lot of them, very, very important buildings uh, in DC and elsewhere. And that's the reason why he was hired was because of that connection. Uh, but of course, what the darn thing looks like, uh, and if we go back and look at the image of it uh, somewhere here, uh, there it is there. Uh, it looks like a gigantic tail has been added on to a frog that's just about to gobble up everything that is out there. But the scale on this thing uh, is really, is, uh, is really off here, the, 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 render, uh, the rendering here. So I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, uh, that was a mistake, but uh, they, uh, they obviously needed different sorts of spaces here. And that's one of the problems that the universities are always going through. How we teach, what is going on in the classroom, the types of classrooms we need and so forth changes so dramatically over time. And how is it that you stay up with this? Can you design the universal space that is used for this, used for that, or do you need special sort? Of, uh, uh, you need uh, need special sorts of things. Uh, I just don't think that there have been many other real mistakes. Uh, as I say, I'm a real fan of the variety of the architecture that surrounds it. I didn't put in Brooks Hall, which was the original natural history building, which has all of those wonderful faces that are out there. They're not faculty, uh, but they're, uh, but they're uh, different animals and so forth that are up there. Uh, and you do, you have this wonderful display of what 
how architecture has evolved here in this country over the years. Perfect. And then we have a couple more questions I want to get to before this hour runs out. So Paul Erickson, he commented on Brooks Hall, which you just um, talked on, but he also says, please discuss uh, the influences on the design for Pavilion 9. Many consider this pavilion a favorite for its unique entry. Yes, well, pavilion number nine, which again, let me show, where is the darn thing? There it is, pavilion number nine, uh, is one of the stranger pavilions because you have the low Tuscan order that comes straight across the front, and then you have this inset niche that is there. And there is a building in Paris designed by a Parisian architect, or was designed by a Parisian architect, which was only a block and a half or where one of Jefferson's quarters were in Paris. And so there may be a connection with that building there. Uh, and again, this is sort of one of these things that is sort of, uh, is sort of up in the air. There is also a building with the very same niche in an English garden in Stowe, uh, yeah, in Stowe Garden in England, which Jefferson had also seen with the same sort of a niche that is in there. So there is a couple of multiple, a couple of multiple sources here for this. Now, some people, and now this is where it really gets into the deep stuff, is that Jefferson did have, uh, became very infatuated with a lady in Paris by the name of Maria Causeway, who was married to an English artist by the name of Causeway. Uh, and he became very, very infatuated with her. And uh, I don't think there was, you know, um, anyway, uh, but uh, uh, they ultimately, he writes a very, very famous letter, my heart and my hand about this because he had promised his wife on her deathbed that he would not remarry. Uh, but some people have seen this and said, well, this is really his homage to Maria Causeway. But as I say, there are these two buildings, one in Paris uh, and the other, or was in Paris and the other uh, over in England, which he saw that have the same, had the same thing, the recess niche. All right, well, thank you so much, Professor Wilson. I'm sure I can speak for everyone here that that was a fascinating talk. <laughs> And I wish I could have gotten to all the questions. I'm over here out of time, but thank you so much for offering okay, well, an hour I'll, of your time. I'll come down to Florida. They have invited me down, and I'll come down and give a much longer talk. There <laughs> we <Whatever>. go. <laughs> you well, heard I, it here. <laughs> also, thank, thank you, Josh, for opening this and, to, and for all the members of the Florida groups. Yes. Uh, because the immediate reaction was we should share this with everyone. And, and um, in that spirit, we, we did open this up. and really thrilled to be uh be hosting the event for everybody yeah, absolutely so please be on the lookout um for the other speakers that will be coming out um we'll have more on that soon but uh until then uh farewell and everyone have a good night bye bye scott <laughs>